So back to evolutionary uh, robotics. We finished our discussion last time on uh, the history of evolutionary robotics, which again is a relatively short history. And we're gonna pivot today and start to talk about challenges and open problems uh, in the field. Um, I feel comfortable saying this as an insider in the field. In many ways, the field is stuck. There are many, there are several major questions that need to be answered before we can start to scale up this uh, technology. First one we're going to talk about today is modularity. Uh, we will talk about a potential solution to this in a pair of algorithms known as the neat and hyper neat algorithms. Uh, we'll talk about, we might start talking about those today, but mostly tomorrow. Next week, we will move on to another constellation of challenges, which are collectively known as crossing the reality gap. As you probably figured out by now, your simulated robots, if I gave you a 3D printer and allowed you to print a physical version of one of your quadrupeds, it's probably not going to do in reality what you see it doing in simulation. How do we guarantee that what we evolve in simulation, if we were to figure out how to manufacture it in reality, will preserve those evolved traits in reality. There has been uh, many potential solutions to this, but no one solution uh, is satisfying yet. These are all sort of partial solutions to the problem. They, they come at the problem from very different directions, and we'll spend a couple weeks looking at some of those. And then we will finish our uh, module on challenges by looking at crowdsourcing as a potential solution to scalability. Maybe one of the ways to scale up the automated design of robots is to have larger and larger numbers of human teachers that are creating fitness functions or influencing the robots using natural language. How would we go about building the infrastructure for that and allow larger and larger numbers of people to influence the evolution of our robot populations? Okay, so that's where we're headed. Let's start with, uh, oh, first of all, let's talk about the assignments. So graduate students, you're moving on to weekly report number two, where you're starting to implement some of the, uh, some of the increments towards your final project. And undergraduates, you're tackling, if you haven't started already, assignment seven, when you're gonna be turning your serial hill climber into a parallel hill climber. Just something to note for assignments six, seven, eight, and nine, what, what you're looking for is you're gonna be implementing these increasingly high-powered evolutionary algorithms. As you will notice pretty quickly, they have different pros and cons. And even when you get to assignment nine, when you're implementing the final evolutionary algorithm, at least for this class, that evolutionary algorithm also leaves a lot to be desired. So note some of these limitations as you go, and one of the things you can do in your final project is to try and improve the evolutionary algorithm and prove to us that you've, involved, uh, that you've improved the evolutionary algorithm because it evolves faster moving or better robots given the same computational effort. So for the same number of evaluations in the simulator, how good can you get your robot to do using a given evolutionary algorithm? Okay, any questions about the assignments, final project, weekly reports, we're all good? Okay, so back to our first challenge uh, in this module, this concept of modularity. We've already touched on this uh, indirectly throughout the course so far. Modularity comes up in lots of different domains, not just robotics, and it is a general principle about how to do things at scale. Um, one of the places you have probably already had personal experience with modularity is writing code. What are some of the aspects of modular code? What are some of the tools or techniques that are out there to help you make your code more modular? They might be so obvious to you, you don't even realize they're there or that that's the function they're serving. Functions. It's an interesting exercise to sit down and try and write, for example, the serial hill climber without using any functions. It's a painful experience, but it's a good learning experience. What else, aside, for fun aside from functions? Objects. Objects, right? Object-oriented programming. Was invent OOP was invented for exactly that, to help you write more modular code, which allows you to create more code at scale. 
Okay, so what is modularity? If we try and abstract it away from coding or robotics, it's this basic idea that there are these things called modules, and they might be functions, they might be objects, they might be classes, and there's some sort of tight coupling within the module and loose coupling between modules. What would be an example of that dense and loose coupling in code? You can use objects and classes and functions, but misuse them so that you actually don't produce modular code. What does that code look like? What starts to happen? No? One of the things you might learn if you take a class on object-oriented programming is making sure that the interface for the class or the object hides a lot of the internal detail. So you might define a class and it has a whole bunch of private methods or, the, or functions that call each other within an instance of that class, but that crosstalk is not seen by other objects that call and use that object. Objects communicate with one another usually using interfaces, which are usually known as the public or, or outward facing methods or functions, and you hide a lot of the internal details in the class. If you create two separate classes and you create two instances of those classes and they're, they're communicating amongst themselves more often than they're calling functions within themselves, you're going to end up uh, having a lot of problem with your code because it is not modular. So we can uh, give the coder, for example, the opportunity, we can give them the tools to create modular systems like objects, classes, and functions. But whether or not they will use it to create something that is modular, who knows? Okay, that's, that's kind of the idea. If you get it right, if you do create modular code, why does it scale up? Because you're able to make slight changes to the system without breaking the entire system. Right? If you have a lot of internal complexity inside, an, uh, uh, inside a class, but it's hidden from other classes, you can ch make changes in that code to fix something or make something more efficient internally inside that class, and the other objects never see it, right? It doesn't affect the public-facing uh, uh, methods. That's, that's the idea. So if you want to know whether you have modular code, or as we're going to see in a moment, a modular neural network or a modular robot, the hallmark or the signature of a modular system is we can make changes to a, a module without breaking the whole thing. Right? I mean, all of engineering is really based on this. Most of our machines, luckily, if one part breaks, usually it can be replaced. It's not always true, but that's, that's sort of the goal. Okay, so again, we just talked about this in terms of object-oriented programming. Here's an example here as it relates to creating things that you're gonna to send to Pyrosim. I'm sure you can think up your own uh, examples. Okay, before we go further though, and we start to apply this to evolutionary robotics, we're gonna distinguish between different kinds of modularity. There's a lot of different kinds of modularity out there. The easiest kind of modularity to think about is structural modularity where you can actually point at different structures. Those are different modules. Again, going back to the code example, you can point to different functions that exist in different files. They are structurally separate from one another, right? The modules take the form of separate structures. It's the easiest for us uh, to think about, and we'll come back to the network example in a moment. The other kind of modularity which is less intuitive is this idea of functional modularity, which is less intuitive, but it has the advantage of us being able to scale up the number of modules that exist in the system without having to increase the size of the system. We've actually seen this idea of functional modularity already in a robot. What was it? Where did we see this idea of functional modularity already? This idea where we have one system, but that system can switch into different modes, and when it's in any one mode, it's exhibiting a particular particular module. Was it the shape detection? Not the shape detection one. Is 
Not quite. The one with the time scales? The time, multiple time scales one. Remember the little humanoid robot that was shaking the block up and down and then left and right? Inside the head of that robot, there were fast neurons and slow neurons. And actually, those two subnetworks are an example of structural modularity. But the slow neurons could push the cluster of fast neurons into different patterns, right? And one of those patterns resulted in this motion, another pattern re uh, resulted in this motion, and so on. So if we just focus on the fast neurons in that humanoid robot example, that subnetwork was exhibiting functional modularity. It could be switched into different functions. Yeah? Okay. We're going to focus mostly on structural modularity today. So this is actually the cartoon that we saw already in the, in the humanoid uh, robot example. Right? So the advantage of structural modularity, just as a reminder, is that it's easy for us to think about a brain that's made up of a bunch of small brains or small modules has the disadvantage, however, that as you have more and more modules, obviously the size of the overall system grows with the number of modules or the number of things that the system needs to do. The disadvantage of functional modularity is it's kind of harder for us to think about, which is usually a reminder that it's going to be harder for us to design such a thing. But it has the advantage that it scales better. We can stuff more stuff in without having to add more structure. So actually, it does relate back to a point that was just made. This is also related to the anthropomorphic robot we saw, the arm that was distinguishing between the spheres and the ellipsoids, right? where you had neuron 47 and 48, which, in theory, you should be able to pack more than two shapes into those two neurons. So yes, that would probably also count as an example of functional modularity. So far, so good. Any questions? No? Okay. Okay, so here's a, just a little cartoon example here of this in a simple neural network. So if we look at the case on the left here, we've got structural modularity. We have six neurons, and we have three, mo three modules here. There's dense connectivity between this module, dense connectivity between this module, and dense connectivity between this module, and just one or no connections between them. So it's still, even structural modularity, although it doesn't scale up super well, it, it helps a little bit. So you remember our discussion about neural networks. If we have n neurons, if we connect every neuron to every other neuron, including itself, it scales n squared, right, quadratically. But if we assume that we're not going to connect every neuron to every other neuron, which would produce a non-modular network, if we're going to cut some of the connections between these growing modules. We can grow a network that has more and more neurons, but at least the synapses, the number of synapses, doesn't necessarily grow quadratically. So it can even structural modularity can help damp down uh, non-scalability. Okay. Functional modularity, of course, uh, we could actually scale things up to more and more modules without adding any more neurons or synapses, period, in theory, in theory. Okay. Again, just as a reminder about the differences between these, but we're going to focus mostly on structural modularity today. Okay. So uh, if we're going to try and bring this idea now into networks and robots, there are three options. One option is to forget about modularity altogether and just evolve a completely unconstrained system. For example, wire up every neuron to every other neuron and just let evolution assign the weights and hope for the best. Option B, we could build some modularity in. We could tell the evolutionary system, you have uh, six neurons and three modules, and the modules are connected in this way, but evolution, you figure out the weights. Option C, we let, we make it easier for evolution to find its own modularity. So in option C, which we're going to see in a moment, we're going to do kind of the equivalent of object-oriented programming. We're going to give evolution the tools to create modules, but we are not going to tell the system a priori what the modules are. right? So in object-oriented programming, you're given the tools of objects and classes and functions. 
but you're not told what the functions should be, right? You are free to create your own modules using those tools. We're going to see whether we can get evolution to do the same thing with networks and robots. So far, so good? Okay. All right. So again, as you can imagine from this buildup, option B, where we define the tasks, uh, is a little bit non-intuitive, right? Uh, instead, we could try and get the evolutionary algorithm to do it. Why is it difficult for the roboticist to do this? Because, as always, thinking about thinking is misleading, right? Okay. We and evolution may have very different ideas about what the appropriate modules are for a robot, given whatever we want the robot to do. So, let's see an example of this, yet another example of why thinking about thinking is misleading. We're going to talk for a moment about distal and proximal perspectives of behavior. So, distal, as the name implies, is from a distance. If we are observing a robot or thinking about a, what a robot may or may not be able to do in its environment, we may start to come up with our ideas about how to break that problem down into sub-problems sub for the robot to perform. Let's imagine in this cartoon example we have nothing more complicated than a two-wheeled robot and it has five ray sensors. So at every point in time it's receiving five numbers on its input layer, which are the length of these five beams. We may notice that during the course of the robot's task that there are a bunch of cylinders and blocks in the robot's environment. And so there's two things going on. There are times at which the robot is driving past the cylinder and times when the robot is driving past the block. So we might start to create two subnetworks inside the robot's brain, one that it should use to deal with cylinders and the other subnetwork that it should use to deal with blocks, right? We're already starting to impose structural modularity on this robot. And though our ideas about these two modules are coming from our distal stance, us standing back and watching the robot watch its environment, right? And as you can see in this cartoon here, at least in this point in time, this cartoon robot doesn't know the difference between cylinders and blocks. At this instant, in both cases, the robot is receiving exactly the same five numbers. It cannot distinguish between these objects. Now, of course, once it continues moving, it probably could distinguish between these objects if it was useful. But again, this is just a reminder that what we see, we see the cylinders, we see the blocks, but the robot doesn't. We are not putting ourselves in the shoes of the robot, right? We, or we are not seeing through the ray sensors of the robot. Okay. So what we would like to try and do as best we can is to take a proximal stance in relation to our robots. We want to try and understand the problem from the point of view of the robot. So if, in, if we try and forget this picture for a moment and focus instead on these two pictures, this is what the robot actually sees at these two points of time. And the moment we see those two bar graphs, our concept of two separate modules immediately disappears, right? Maybe those two modules were not a good idea, right? Again, just a reminder that thinking about thinking is misleading, and we should not, in, in theory, it seems we should probably not try and impose these modules on the robots themselves, because we'll probably get it wrong. It's very hard to see the world through the robot, through the robot's eyes, okay. Okay, so let's look at an actual experiment. This is, again, another early experiment uh, in the literature, but which became very famous because of this concept of modularity. You might remember the little mo uh, Kepra robot here. It's about the size of a hockey puck. It's got its two little wheels, and you can add stuff on top. In this case, they're adding on a gripper, and that gripper can close uh, around a sugar cube, which you see in the photograph here. But in this actual experiment, they're going to put the Kepra robot in the arena you see top left, and they're going to put little wooden cylinders, little wooden pegs inside the arena. The robot has to move around, find uh, the peg, pick it up, drive to the edge of the arena, and drop the peg off the, uh, over the far wall, over the wall of the arena. Right? 
my very description of that task might already be influencing your thinking about the modules, right? Clearly there are four separate behaviors here. Find peg, grab peg, uh, take peg to wall, toss peg over wall, right? Seems obvious that there are these four <laughs> separate modules, okay. So uh, hold on to that for a moment. Um, not too unfamiliar from what we've seen before. We've got a robot that has um, four motor neurons at the output layer. Let's start with the motor. So spinning the left motor, spinning the left wheel, spinning the right wheel, and then a third and fourth set of motor commands, which is uh, object pickup and object release. So at any point, in, uh, we'll, we'll see more details of that in a moment, but for the moment, those are the four things that the robot can do. It has seven, uh, six infrared sensors, which are basically six beams. Again, these are like ray sensors. And then one light barrier sensor, which is inside the gripper. So there's a little uh, laser that goes from one side of the gripper to the other. And if that beam is unbroken, then the robot is not holding anything. If the beam is broken, it is holding a peg. There's nothing else in this arena that it can, can hold. Right. So not that dissimilar from what we've seen before. Okay, so given the task, which we'll formalize as a fitness function in a moment, find all the objects and get them out of the arena, there's lots of different ways you could think about decomposing this. And you could almost start to write down some object-oriented code to put in this robot to do this, right? It seems obvious to us what the, the way in which to break down this relatively complicated behavior, this is probably one of the most complicated behaviors we've seen so far. Our natural instinct as engineers or computer scientists is to break this problem down into easier sub-problems for the robot. We are going to try to resist that uh, impulse in this experiment. In order to do this, in order to resist this impulse, the experimenters created actually five different neural networks, and we'll walk through these. They get increasingly complicated as we go. Let's just sort of talk about the experimental design for a moment. They're gonna do five evolutionary trials. They're gonna try and evolve the robot to do this task five times. The first time they're gonna do it with, they're gonna evolve network A. The second evolutionary trial, they're gonna use network B and so on. And they want to see, as they start to allow evolution to evolve these increasingly high-powered neural networks, which, if any of these, do enable the robot to actually do the task, and at what point? The first neural network is pretty simple, right? Very feed-forward. We have these seven uh, sensors. Uh, we have so seven input neurons. We have four motor commands, four things the robot can do. So we have an output layer of four. No hidden layers, no recurrence. This is the simplest possible thing you could imagine. Each sensor is attached to each motor. It's non-modular, non-recurrent, no hidden. This is the simplest thing you can possibly imagine. The next neural network uh, has a hidden layer, as you can see. Imagine that we evolved network A and we can't get the Kepra to perform this task. We evolve the Kepra with network B and it does succeed at the task. What could we conclude from that? Going back to the task for a moment. We've added a hidden layer and evolution has made use of it. What does a hidden layer do? It allows a nonlinear transformation from what's coming in at the input layer to the output layer, right? <laughs> Remember back to the AND, OR, and XOR functions that we created neural networks for? You can't solve the XOR function unless you do a nonlinear transformation from your input values to your output values. So if the robot can succeed with an evolved B, but not with an evolved A, that means that performing a nonlinear transformation in what the robot senses to what it chooses to do under those circumstances, if that's a nonlinear transformation, or that it requires a nonlinear transformation to do that. Yeah? If the robot fails with A and also fails with B, and we move on to C, in which case we are now adding in a recurrent layer, 
And this is drawn a little bit differently from what you've seen before. We've got our seven input neurons, our four motor neurons, and we have one, two, three, four additional neurons, which are the one, two, three, four hidden neurons. And you can see that the input layer is flowing to these two hidden neurons. These two hidden neurons are recurrently connecting back to the other hidden layer, uh, the other hidden neurons, and then out to the motors, and also back to themselves. So there is a cycle within the hidden layer, just a different way of drawing recurrent connections. If evolution fails to evolve success using network B, but succeeds in evolving success with network C, what does that tell us about this task? That this task requires memory, that the robot needs to remember something about this task. I don't know about you, but I don't see how it would need memory. But again, thinking about thinking is misleading. We don't know, right? So this is the experimenter's way to pick apart what are the necessary conditions, the necessary and sufficient condi conditions for evolution to be able to evolve success for this task. All of, the, all of these three networks so far are non-module. They're, they're non-modular, right? Pretty much everything is connected to everything else. So in network D, we are now going to build in modularity, and we're building in structural modularity, and you can see it. Here's module A, and here is module B. So how does this, uh, so how does this work? We've got, our seven, uh, we've got our seven sensor neurons down here, and we are going to detect at every point in time what's happening with the robot. If the robot at a given point in time, if its gripper is empty, we're going to read out the four values in this module and send those to the motors. So this part of the robot's brain is going to control its motors at this point in time. If the gripper is full at any point in time, these four motor neurons are going to seize control of the motors. Yeah? So you can imagine the robot moving about in its environment, doing its thing, and from time to time it's holding a peg or not, and its two sub-brains are switching back and forth and grabbing control of the motors. Where is the cut point? What is the modularity that we are assuming or building into this network? There's different ways we can take a problem and carve it up into sub-problem. What's the assumption that's being made here? So we have two different modules here. And so as you can imagine, the numbers that are arriving at these two different modules are going to cause the motors to do different things. So the robot is going to act differently under different conditions. Now what the robot actually does is, as always, up to evolution, it's tinkering with the synaptic weights in this network. So we don't know what it's going to do, but we're influencing evolution to do two different things. What is the cut point here? What are we deciding is the important feature about when you should be doing A or doing B? It could be if you detect an object in A or the body in the cool. Seems so it seems blindingly obvious, right? That the robot should be doing something when it's holding the peg and should be doing something else when it's not holding the peg what exactly that should be in terms of the fine details of the motors, who knows, but it just, it seems really obvious, right? So we're gonna, we're, we think we are helping evolution here by, give, by helping it tune two different behaviors for two different circumstances, which would be hard or impossible for evolution to do in these cases, because everything is connected to everything else, right? Remember uh, our signature of modularity, which means we should be able to tinker with one part of a module without breaking the overall function, functionality of the system. Imagine that uh, we have a robot that has evolved the ability to uh, do what it's supposed to do when the gripper is full. 
which is module B. Whenever it manages to grab uh, a peg, it immediately takes it to the closest wall and, dr and drops the peg over the wall. But it has a very hard time ever finding and grabbing a peg to begin with. It does it very rarely, but it's a very bad searcher. It has a hard time finding the peg. So we could imagine this partial solution or these partly evolved networks evolving over time and a mutation falls within module A and slightly improves that new robot's ability to find pegs. Module A works a little bit better. The robot's more efficient at looking and going and grabbing a peg. That mutation, which improves that sub-behavior, does not affect what the robot does when it actually has a peg in hand, right? That's what we're, that's what we're looking for. In these non-modular networks here, we could also imagine a hypothetical robot which is good at discarding of pegs once it's holding one, but not good at finding one. And any mutation that hits one of those hypothetical networks might improve the ability to find pegs, but at the same time as it disrupts its ability to get rid of the peg. This is a, uh, this is a universal problem in machine learning known as catastrophic forgetting. We may have mentioned this before. You see this in lots of different forms in lots of different machine learning applications, including robotics. You're trying to get a machine or a robot to do multiple things. And once it's good at one thing and you try and teach it or evolve it to get better at doing something else, it gets better at that something else at the same rate that it forgets how to do the previous thing. You all have probably had the experience yourself of catastrophic uh, forgetting. It is a non-trivial problem. And one obvious solution to catastrophic forgetting is to try and modularize the machine or the robot, right? That is why modularity is helpful. It helps with things like catastrophic forgetting. Okay, okay, but again, we have decided that this is a good cut point. So we're gonna look at a fifth network now, and this network takes a little while to wrap your mind around. This net neural, the architecture of this neural network is designed to allow evolution to create modularity if it's useful but we are not going to assume what the cut point should be. All right, so this is the one we're, we're, we're most focused on. So let's start with the input layer, which still looks familiar. We have our seven uh, input neurons at the bottom layer here. And then you'll then notice there are four sets of four output neurons. The four groupings that you see here correspond to controlling the left motor, the right motor, uh, the pickup behavior, and the release behavior. You should be a little confused at this point because it immediately looks like we're imposing structural modularity here. It looks like one, two, three, four modules, right? Not quite, not quite, okay. Let's look at just uh, the first module, which is responsible for the left motor. You'll notice there are two black neurons here, and these are the selector neurons. At any point in time, uh, at any point in time while the robot is being operated by this network, we look at these two selector neurons, and if the value of the left selector neuron is greater than the value of the right selector neuron, then the left hand output neuron takes control of the left motor. Otherwise, if the right selector neuron is greater than the left selector neuron, the right output neuron takes control of the left motor. So there are two networks here, these two white neurons, which at any time can grab control of the left motor, but the condition under which they do so is not being dictated by us saying, do it when the gripper is full or when the gripper is empty. It's up to these selector neurons to decide when that happens. And you'll notice that there are synapses that are flowing from the input neurons to the white output neurons, but also synapses that are flowing from the input neurons to the selector neurons. 
What does that mean? So what are those synapses that are controlling the selector neurons doing? They're obviously in influencing the values of the selector neurons, but what is, their, what is their role? Why did the investigators put those synapses in there? Let's go back to our example here, which is still somewhat intuitive. We could imagine that it's useful for the robot to do something when the gripper is full and something else when the gripper is empty. Uh, we've got six infrared sensors down here and the seven uh, light breaking sensor. Uh, these were European, so this is non-English, but it should be the light breaking sensor here. So imagine that this neuron here is zero when the beam is unbroken inside the gripper and one when the beam is broken. There is a peg inside the gripper. There are synapses flowing from this neuron to the selector neurons. If evolution tinkers with the weights of these synapses, evolution could cause the output neurons to switch. All the left output neurons will control their four behaviors when there is a peg there, or all four output neurons on the right, all right hand output neurons take control of the motors when there is not a peg there. Right? You can imagine all the other synapses flowing from the six infrared sensors. All of those that are going to the black neurons, if evolution reduces those weights down to zero and they disappear, then it is only the light breaking sensor that is influencing the switching of these two modules. So in essence, in theory, evolution could create this network, network D, inside of network E. So far, so good. So evolution is free to choose how this modularity is implemented. On the other hand, it may decide that the third infrared sensor, when that beam is short, use module A. When that beam is long, use module B. Doesn't seem very intuitive to us, but thinking about thinking is misleading. We're gonna give evolution the ability by mutating the synapses that flow from the input neurons to the selector neurons to influence the sensory conditions that cause switching from one structural module to the other. And by tinkering with the synapses that flow from the input layer to the output neurons, evolution is tinkering with what the robot actually does when this module is in charge of the left motor or this module is in charge of the left motor, or this module is in charge of the right motor, or this module is in charge of the right motor, and so on. Make sense? So to be clear, the module is a combination of the selector neuron and the output neuron that it controls? The selector neurons are selecting which of two modules have control over the motor at any given time. And there could be any combination and there could be any combination of those, yeah? So I think it's worthwhile before we go on to build up a little bit more intuition about network E. Let's imagine we run evolution and evolution evolves all these synaptic weights in such a way that the, um, the left selector neuron's value is always higher than the right selector neuron in this group. Same thing here. This, is all, the value of this neuron is always larger than the value of this neuron, this one, this one, this one. So there's never, uh, the, the, selector, the pairs of selector neurons, the relative value is always the same. One, whatever its value is, is always higher than the value of the other selector neuron in all four of these groupings. Let's imagine evolution produces such a network and that network allows the robot to solve the task. What is evolution telling us about the nature of this task or the way, the ways in which this task can be solved? Modularity is not needed. Exactly, modularity is not needed. 
right? So I give you a programming project and I give you the ability to create functions in your code and you don't use it. You write a perfectly nice piece of code that has no functions or function calls in it. You are demonstrating non-verbally to me that I don't need this modularity tool that you made available to me called functions, right? If that were the case. If we were to run this multiple times, and in all of these successful evolved solutions, we see that from time to time, the value of the left selector neuron is greater than the value of the right selector neuron, but something happens to the sensor values and it switches, the right selector neuron becomes greater than the left selector neuron, and then it goes back again. And that's happening in one or more of these groupings. What is evolution telling us in that case? That modularity is needed, right? It's useful. If that switching happens exactly when it's holding a peg or not holding a peg, then we as mere humans can understand, right? We get it. There's, you should be doing one thing when the gripper is empty or when the gripper is full. Again, you can probably imagine from all this buildup that unfortunately it's not gonna be that easy. We are going to see in a moment that indeed the, select, the pair, pairs of selector neurons do switch their relative values. Evolution is making use of modularity. And in the, the 11 years that I've taught this class, I still cannot figure out how, where the cut points are. Um, so when they expand this uh, neural net, did they do it with just the purpose of training the robot and getting like, a good neural net and good behavior out? Or did they kind of do it with the purpose of figuring out how to further develop like a better fine-tuned neural net that they would then use as like their final product? Uh, closer to your latter point. So the, the researchers obviously weren't really interested in cleaning up an arena. They're interested in this more basic science question, which is we know, we as humans know that modularity is useful. Clearly it is very useful. But how do, if we're going to evolve solutions, how do we best allow evolution to create modularity? Okay. In biological evolution, Mother Nature has discovered modularity over and over and over again. What is some examples of modularity in nature? You are a living example of many, many different kinds of modularity. What are some of them? Absolutely, right? So if I, were, if I were to point to a part of my body, it's not 30% stomach and 40% lung and 20% blood vessel. It's one of those things, right? You could imagine a continuum of functionality inside an organism, but again, it seems so strange to us. It's so obvious that it should be modular, right? We have organiz organs. Organs are made up of, remember your high school biology? Cells. Cells are made up of uh, uh, yeah, organelles, you know, now I'm forgetting as well, right? It's modularity all the way down and modularity all the way up, right? We are all members of the human species and we are distinct from other primate species. We cannot uh, intermate and so on. There are clear cut points between species. Mother nature has discovered modularity over and over and over again. But it is not clear, ironically, it is not clear what are the kinds of selection pressures? What are the conditions out there in nature that selected for organisms that had more modularity than others? Way back in the distant past, there were probably organisms that had less modularity and they could not compete with our modular ancestors. But what, what were the conditions under which that happened? Yes. So it could be that, like, there were at one point, maybe just at the cellular level, but there were separate organisms that served, that did various things particularly well, yep. sort of conglomerated into one thing, and then you have essentially a bunch of different organisms that are all serving distinct purposes that kind of become a singular. Exactly, and what you're describing is what's known as endosymbiosis for those that are interested. So you have a symbiosis between the cell and the mitochondria, and one 
is actually incorporated inside the other, right? So there were these separate, very separate modules, the proto-mitochondria and the proto-cell. They came together, and in some ways, they actually lost modularity. They became more tightly integrated. So as always in nature, there are exceptions to every rule. We talked about the exceptions to bilateral symmetry last time. There are reasons under which you might actually want to decrease modularity, get things like specialization. So the cell says, I'm going to be responsible for these things. Mitochondria, you be responsible for these other things. And neither of us have to be responsible for everything. Right? So there are a lot of examples um, where that, that decreases. So although we know that modularity is generally useful, the devil is in the details. Right? What modularity? How much modularity under, under what conditions? It's probably beyond human in intuition if we're going to create robots with more or less modularity to know what that modularity should be, how much, what are the cut points, uh, and so on. So let's let the evolutionary algorithm figure it out. But tr it's tricky, right? N none of these networks allow, would even allow evolution to do that. Actually, I take that back. It could, it could tune some of these weights down to zero, prune out some of these connections and actually make modules. But it's probably going to be pretty difficult for evolution to do that because it's starting with non-modular material. Any mutation to any one synapse in this network is going to influence the robot's behavior in all of whatever it is it's trying to do, right? Not true here. So far, so good. Any questions about network E before we move on? Yes. I have a question. Sure. That's a great question, right? So this was an early experiment, and for a lot of people, it's still unsatisfying because there are, there are strong hints to evolution built in here, right? So there are kind of already modules, and evolution is only free to switch between the modules. It cannot add modules or remove them. There is a growing, uh, there's a, a separate literature on growing neural networks. So start with a small network, add neurons and synapses as you go, and again, in those growing networks, could you imagine an evolutionary algorithm that biases evolution to add modularity at the same time that it's growing the network? In theory, it should be possible, but again, no one has a clear way on how to, to do that. We'll actually see some examples of growing networks uh, towards the end of the course. We'll come back to that. Okay. Okay, so again, we kind of talked about this. We're going to look at these five networks one after the other and identify at which point evolution starts to succeed. We're going to look at whether internal units or hidden nodes are useful. If A fails but B through D succeeds, then internal hidden neurons are at least necessary. We're going to look at recurrent connections, but we're most interested in this lecture on the usefulness of modularity. Do D and or E do better than A, B, or C? As you can imagine from all this buildup, E blows the other four networks out of the water. So as usual, we have evolutionary time on the horizontal axis here. And we have a vertical axis here, which is reporting fitness as the number of successful epochs. So what is an epoch? We're going to take each neural network controller, drop it into the robot, and we're going to evaluate the robot 15 times. We're going to put the robot at different positions and orientations in the arena, and we're going to allow that robot to act for 200 time steps in its, uh, in its, uh, uh, in its lifetime. Or we'll stop things early if it actually found a peg and dropped it outside the arena during that epoch. Either of those conditions are met. We pick up the robot, put it at a new position and orientation in the arena. It's still running the same neural network and let go of the robot and let it do its thing again. And we, we can then imagine a fitness function, which is how many out of the 15 epochs did it successfully find a peg and drop it uh, outside of the arena. And you can see that even very early on, 
Network E was doing a much better job with relatively little evolution at finding and getting ri rid of uh, pegs. We evolved for a thousand generations. As I mentioned, we're gonna run five different experiments. We're gonna do evolution with these five different neural networks. For each, for each of these five different controllers, we're gonna do 10 replications. So a replication here just means we're gonna run the evolutionary algorithm once with network A, go back and run the evolutionary algorithm again with network A, we're gonna do that 10 times for each of the five networks, giving us a total of 50 evolutionary runs. And we can see that on average, E does much better than A through D. Okay, so the investigators, even early on in the, in the field of evolutionary robotics, they're on the right track. They've been able to create something that allows evolution to create modularity and create modularity in its own way. Okay. We're gonna look at one of these evolved uh, network E's, and we're gonna ask the question first of all, when we crack it open in a moment, we're gonna look inside. Turns out that unfortunately, it does not seem to be putting the cut point where we might imagine it to be. It is not that there is one module that controls the motors when the gripper is empty, and another one that controls uh, the robot when the gripper is full. I'm gonna try and summarize this verbally and then we'll look at the actual data. In the case of one evolved controller, uh, that controller had two states or two different modules that evolved. So at least our job is a little bit easier. There aren't a whole bunch of modules, there's just two. Only the right motor, this grouping, only in this grouping do the relative values of the selector neuron switch. So in this evolved network E, sometimes this output neuron is in charge of the right motor, and sometimes this neuron is in charge of the right motor. In the other three groupings, the relative values between the pair of selector neurons never passes one another. So evolution did not make use of modularity for the left motor or for pickup or for release. So what does that mean? It means that the robot is doing different things with just the right motor under some sensory conditions and, uh, and other conditions. Yeah, so far so good? Okay, take a deep breath, here we go. Let's start with the picture in the very top left. In this case, they put five pegs in the robot's environment. One, two, three, four, five. And the robot started, it's not quite clear from this picture, but the robot started moving. Uh, in this case, it drove and grabbed this peg, continued moving forward, stopped and faced this wall, and dropped the peg over the far wall. After it did, it turned around and started driving, picked up this one, drove it. Again, it's hard to see from this picture. Either dropped it here, dropped it here. For a fixed period of time, it was able to find and, and throw away three of the, the pegs, and then it ran out of time. Okay, during that, during that trajectory, these are traces inside the robot's brain over time. So the horizontal axis now says life cycles, but you can think of this as time steps in the, the simulator, right? Okay, so uh, let's have a look at pickup and release I think these two are the most obvious. So these four uh, rows here correspond to the four motor neurons. So the robot is driving along its in, in its environment and suddenly the pickup neuron starts to fire and the robot starts to do this and then does this. And then it's holding itself like this for a moment. It's driving around and suddenly the release neuron starts to chirp and the robot starts to do this and drops, uh, drops the, the, the peg. You can see that the release neuron and the pickup neuron are both chirping at about the same time. So the robot is kind of doing something like, like this, right? These periods when both of them are quiet, the gripper is not moving at all. So far so good. Here's the left motor. You can see it's mostly black, meaning the, le the left motor is spinning most of the time. For some period here, the left motor starts to slow down and stutter. 
So the left motor is being relatively slow. Uh, and same thing with the right motor. Most of the time the right motor is spinning, but from time to time in these white patches here, the right motor actually stops moving altogether. There are short periods here in time when there are overlapping bands of white in LM and RM. What does that tell you about the robot at that point in time? It's stationary, right? The robot isn't moving. At different points in time in which, and again, it's hard to see here. Let's pick this point in time here. LM is black and RM is white. What does that mean? What is the robot doing? Turning which way? LM is black and RM is white. It's turning to the right, right? Left motor is spinning and the right motor is stationary, right? So again, you're gonna kind of have to visualize based on the data here of what's going on. So if you squint at these four rows for a while, you can see the robot driving straight, turning, at least triggering the pickup and release. But we don't know whether it's actually grabbing a peg or not. In order to figure that out, we need to look at the seven sensor values, and particularly the light beam sensor, which goes white and then is black for a while. What do these black bands in the LB row tell you? What's going on? Yep. Holding a peg. It's holding a peg here, and then it is no longer holding a peg holding a peg here, holding a peg here, which makes sense, right? We saw from the trajectory trace that the robot cleaned up three pegs and we can see when and for how long it was holding those pegs. We can see the, uh, in, the six infrared sensors, which are the length of the beams. <laughs> Most of the time they're quiet, meaning the beam is unbroken. But from time to time, we see that uh, the uh, beams are being broken. What does this period tell you in here when almost all, almost all of the beams are firing? Or at least the center three of them are firing. What's happening at this time? It's when it's near a wall, right? So we know the robot is holding a peg and then shortly before it drops it, you can see that the infrared sensors start to chirp, right? So this is starting to look like what we're looking for. The robot is carrying a peg. The wheels are turning. It sees a wall and it is no longer holding the peg. It probably dropped the peg over the, the wall, right? Okay, so if we're looking at the, the four motor neurons and the seven uh, sensor neurons, everything is looking good, yeah? Let's have a look at A through H for a moment. These are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight possible cut points that are at least intuitive to humans. So in A, this is all the time that the robot is carrying an object and hopefully looking for a wall. So we are now, as the investigators, drawing dashes here when one or another condition that makes sense to us is in effect. The robot is not holding a peg, it is holding a peg, it isn't, it is, and so on. The gripper is empty, so the inverse of that. C is, uh, when does the robot see something? It could be looking at a peg, it could be looking at a wall. These are periods in which the eye sensors, the infrared sensors are chirping. Something is in the robot's uh, field of view. That's a p potential. Uh, situation. E is just when it's looking at a peg. F is when it's approaching a wall, avoiding an object, avoiding a wall, and so on. So given what the robot actually experienced in this case, we can sort of assign this cut point, these different situations. We are now going to switch and look at the modularity part here. And the modularity part corresponds to the two selector neurons controlling the right motor. Remember that this pair is going to switch relative values. Sometimes the left selector neuron is greater than the right selector neuron or vice versa. So we're going to paint this modularity row here black when the left selector neuron is greater than the right selector neuron. We're going to paint it white 
when that is not the case. This is the actual switching of the robot between these different evolved modules. So now I want you to glance back and forth between the modularity row and rows A through H. Does the switching of the modularity match any of the human designed cut points? Again, after years of staring at this figure, I can't see any correspondence. Wouldn't it be more useful to look at the um, selector neuron for the pickup? Remember that that never happens. So for a pickup, one of these two is always greater value than the other one. So evolution in this case never switched between two modules controlling the pickup behavior. So the pickup response seems to have nothing to do with the modularity, right? When it picks something up, it doesn't switch from one module to another. Whatever is happening is not that simple. Same with release. Same with release and same for the left motor. It's only the right motor. What is the condition here? What causes the robot to switch? What, what sensory state causes the robot to switch from one module to the other. Hard to tell, right? If you look at the modularity row, it actually seems to correspond pretty well with I2 and I3, two of the six infrared sensors, but it is also not a perfect match. It's close, but not quite. So there's something about I2 and I3 that's causing this robot's brain to do different things under, the, under something that I2 and I3 are reporting, but it's also a function of some of the other things that are happening. It's not, not obvious, right? So good, both good news and bad news here, right? We can get evolution to create modularity as, as that modularity is appropriate for the task from the point of view of the robot. So we avoid our thinking about thinking, which we know is misleading, but the end result, at least for now, is not something that is human interpretable. Usually, good coders, when they create modular code, they divide up their code into modules that make sense to other humans. If you read well-written code and you more or less understand the problem that that code is trying to solve, it usually makes sense, right? Not so, at least in terms of, of evolutionary robotics. So again, kind of an open problem. Could we imagine a better approach where evolution still produces modules, but they are modules that make more sense to us? In, in other words, can evolution, quote unquote, explain to us how it is dividing up the problem? We know that it's dividing up the problem, just not how. Okay, I think we'll skip this one uh, in the interest of time. We'll move on to this set of plots here. This is like we saw in the minimal cognition experiment. This is a visualization of just one evolved network E. It's the one we just talked about. We played back, the investigators put that uh, network E back into the robot and evaluated the robot many, many, many times. How did they do that? Um, they took the robot and they put it near the wall with an empty gripper. And the horizontal axis here, uh, sorry, the vertical axis here is how far the robot was placed from the wall. So they put the robot close to the wall, further away from the wall, further away from the wall, further away from the wall. The horizontal axis corresponds to the angle of the robot relative to the wall. So zero is the robot is facing the wall. 180 degrees is the robot is facing with its gripper away from the wall. So each pixel in this panel corresponds to a particular position and orientation of the robot relative to the wall. So far, so good. Second panel is they did exactly the same thing. They put the robot at all those positions and orientations, but in this case, they gave it a peg. It started by holding a peg. 
They did the same thing. They put the robot back into the arena in different positions and orientations, but in this case, positions and orientations relative to a cylinder or a peg with its gripper empty. <coughs> Fourth case, again, they put the robot closer, far, head on or head away from a cylinder, and it's already holding another cylinder. So they're going to really look at the generality of this neural network. How well does the robot do with this network under a vast number of conditions? Each condition remembers a pixel, and they're then going to color the pixel. White is, um, the white is the robot did nothing. It neither tried to pick up or release. The black pixel, the robot uh, triggered the pickup behavior. The gray pixel triggered the release behavior. How did the robot do? Let's just focus on these four cases for now. Seems to release the um, block and it's an angle that's facing the wall. Exactly. So in this condition here, it's facing a wall. It is holding a peg. And the gray says there are many cases where it triggers the drop behavior. But when it's far from the wall, everything is white. So if it's too far away, it does not trigger the pickup, uh, the release behavior. Makes sense, right? Generally speaking, the robot seems to be doing the right thing. Tell me about this little black region here. What does that mean? First of all, I can't quite see, but is it a little offset from zero? It is a little offset from zero. It's a little bit to the right. Yep. So it's like this small angle between zero and maybe like 10, I don't know, yep. where it is unable to drop it. Uh, this is not dropping. Oh. Black is uh, pickup. Oh, where it's unable to pick it up. Okay. Yeah, so if, it, if, it's facing, if it's facing the object, it's very close to the object, and it's almost head on, it does not trigger the pickup behavior. But if it's off a little bit to the right, it does. So it's basically never making a mistake. There's never an opportunity where it could have grabbed something and it didn't. Maybe a couple cases here. Generally speaking, this robot is doing the right thing. Let's look at these four panels down here. Exactly the same thing. We're going to exhaustively test a second evolved e-controller under all these conditions. And it turns out that the robot does make a mistake in this case. In this case, the robot mistakenly releases an object when it encounters another object close up on its right side. How do we know that? We need, we're looking for cylinder gripper full. So the robot is near a cylinder, but its gripper is already filled with another cylinder. If, that's, if the robot comes close to that uh, cylinder and the cylinder is off just to its right, but it's right there, it drops the cylinder that it's currently holding, it makes a mistake. It should not be releasing that, it should be getting, getting rid of it. So in just these conditions, the robot is making a mistake, and I'm going to toggle back and forth between what we just described and the next panel. This next panel corresponds to during evolution. So we're going back in time now, when this Network E was evolving, which relative position and orientations, sorry, which positions and orientations, relative to cylinders or relative to walls, did the robot ever see? If it saw those conditions, we'd put a black pixel there. If it never saw though, if it never experienced that situation during evolution, we leave that pixel white. Why did the robot make a mistake? If you keep your eye on the little gray triangle down here, this corresponds to the situations in which the robot makes a mistake. It's holding a cylinder, it sees another cylinder, and because it saw that other cylinder, it drops the one it's holding. You'll notice that that region is all white, it was all white during evolution. It never experienced that situation during evolution. It's a new thing. 
Right? We've seen this before. Evolution is not an optimizer. It's a satisficer. It did as well as it could under the situations it experienced. But once we put the robot out into the real world or conditions it never saw, in a few cases it makes mistakes. This is, of course, extremely important to us. If we're going to put autonomous cars on our roads, those autonomous cars are going to experience situations that are not in the training data. How do we know that the autonomous car will do the right thing under those conditions? At the moment, no one has an answer to that. OK. OK, so what did we learn from this experiment? We learned, uh, multiple, we learned several things. The evolution was a success because evolution on its own, without us having to tell it how to do it, it discovered many things. It discovered how to cut the modules, which sensor states would be experienced during, moving, during movement. Not everything is black here, right? So given the experiences that the robot had, it decided, quote unquote decided, which of those behaviors or which of those situations uh, sorry, which situation should trigger which modules? And it decided when any one of those modules was in effect, what the robot should do in those cases. Yeah? And finally, what each module should be doing. So evolution discovered that, uh, discovered or d designed its own experiences. It discovered that in some of those uh, experiences, it should be doing one thing. And in other experiences, it should be doing something else. It figured out how to switch between them, how to detect them and switch between them, and what it should be doing under those different conditions. Great, except, of course, it's completely unintelligible to us. OK. OK. Uh, I will leave you to finish taking notes on that. We finished a couple minutes early.